Good morning, everyone. Hope everyone's well rested after yesterday. Um, I'm joined on stage today by uh, the Kaiji Mellon guys. If you guys could quickly just introduce yourself, sure. tell us your role here. Hi. Um, I'm uh, Curtis Layton. I'm Dave Rawlinson. I'm a PhD student. I'm Howie Chosit. I'm a professor in the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon. And that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about robotics. So you might be able to see it's a little low at the moment, but it's, <laughs> there's a robot snake on stage as well, which is a bit scary. I hope everyone's OK with that. Um, so yeah, please uh, go ahead. Give us a quick explanation of what we got here. So can we have the, the PowerPoint on the main screen? Yeah. Please? <laughs> <laughs> yes, nicely. OK. So a lot of people, when they think of a robot, they have this anthropomorphic vision. They think of a humanoid robot that's going to come into your house, maybe do, do your dishes. And some of the more informed people know that there are a lot of robot arms in factories, painting cars, welding, and what have not. However, the animal kingdom is full of non-human animals that have been very successful in getting into all sorts of places, doing all sorts of tasks. So one robot is like a snake. So what's nice about these robots is they have all these degrees of freedoms with which they can thread through tightly packed volumes and get to locations that people and machinery otherwise can't access. So here we have is one of our snake robots. Why don't we drive around a little bit? There you go. It's gradually making its way towards me. <laughs> yeah. So not only can we get into tight spaces where people and conventional machinery otherwise can't access, for something with a small size, we're able to achieve a bunch of mobility capabilities that conventional devices, robots, can't. So for example, this guy here can roll like a wheel, but could also uh, look Whoa. around and get onto pipes and crawl up and uh, uh, all sorts of things. So is that a camera I can see in the front? Yes. So, so, so what, what, what you can see is on the video, you can see what the robot sees as it's going through some, some tight terrain there. Wow. So if we want, we can use you as a volunteer. Oh, I, yeah, I'd love to be uh, tackled by a so, robot snake. So let's get the camera on his leg. All right. Oh. So, so one application is, is these robots, they, they do a variety of things. They crawl on the ground, they, they climb up pipes, whatever. For any one of those tasks, maybe you can build a better mechanism, but there's no Whoa. one mechanism that can do all of these tasks. So it's the versatility of these devices that make them special. So here, you know, of course, there really is no real oh, wow. application for climbing heavy. legs. It's kind of heavy. But you can imagine in some remote location where you want to swim through a moat, get on a field, go through some rubble pile. Strangle a tech editor. Scrabble tech editor. Uh, only, only a nice one. Not, not, not. <laughs> only, only the nice ones. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then climb up a Whoa. flagpole and then look around. Whoa. It's kind of like a massage. Mm -hmm. It's kind of nice. So is this the first time a robot's touched you? <laughs> Not the first and probably not the last either. OK. Wow. Just so you know, we can squeeze it harder if you oh, want. If I really just don't want this leg anymore. <laughs> OK. Wow. It's kind of, I kind of have, I mean, how is it controlled? Is that you know, pneumatics? Um... So, so this robot is a modular mechanism. It has many degrees of freedom, but, but it's a repeating module over and over again. So you have these 16 independent motions. Right. And what Curtis is doing, he's driving the robot. He's just saying, go forward, climb up. And then the autonomy, the science, the theory, is, is brokering which degrees of freedom to move when in order to achieve what he desires. Right. So and I mean, if you can take a look at this, it's a, it's a very standard, uh, if you can show the camera guy on this uh, front stage here, it's a very typical uh, gamepad they're using here. So I guess you can just, yeah, tell it to go forward and the rest of it. So, so if you will, what I'll do is, let me, let me talk about some applications for these robots. So one of them is search and rescue. What we want to do is we want to provide a tool that will extend the reach of rescue workers so they can stay out of harm's way and they won't cause collateral damage while looking for trapped survivors. In this video here, this is a, a video from the Twin Towers. My colleague Robin Murphy who's at Texas A&M. Uh, she sent these robots into the Twin Towers uh, on the second day. This is from the South Tower. And what happens is, is we have a robot that's about the size of a shoebox that's driving around trying to figure out if there's any chance of survivors. In this particular image here, and I mean no disrespect to these people, this is actually a woman's head. This is her arm. And this is someone else's arm. And this is a wristwatch. So you can see, at the time, we, we didn't know that. But this robot had to stop because it was limited by its mob mobility capabilities. But just being able to look around, poke, and get different vantage points would have allowed the rescue workers 
to develop a better situational awareness as to what they were seeing. So in these applications, what we're doing is we're getting into uh, hard to reach places. So one application is, is getting into pipes. We want to be able to do some kind of uh, inspections. So a lot of you know about the uh, disaster that happened in Japan in, after the tsunami. And uh, they needed, you know, the Japanese weren't uh, well prepared to send robots into the uh, nuclear site in order to assess the damage. What we want to do is develop a tool that can be used by inspectors to do their regular job and have a dual use to service search and rescue. So what we did uh, this past May is we sent our snake robots into a power plant in Svetendorf. Actually, Dave was the lead engineer for that, so if you want to talk about that. Right, so the, the idea is you want to get into places that are very tough to get to for kind of traditional wheeled equipment. So what we did is we were able to go through a pipe. We went vertically through a couple bends. Uh, uh, basically, we're like a very articulated boroscope. So once you get into a place and you want to see something very specific, you can always move your head, get plenty of detail. In this case, we moved over into another vessel. Even though these probes are sticking in the way and would normally block kind of traditional equipment, we can always as snake around it. Um, and the, the camera is really just kind of the starting point. Right now we're focusing on inspection, but the idea is that the robot's modular and it has such dexterity that when you need to start doing work and start putting tools on the front, uh, this would be the system to do that. So it means the tools you could use wouldn't just be a visual camera. You could add sensors and like IR sensors and anything like that. Right, so what's pretty cool about this image is we're now 50 feet deep into the vessel and what's floating around, if you see little particulates, that's just dust because the wow. air is so still. Uh, I think on. Let's go into the next slide. Uh, perfect. So another application we did was archaeology. We, we were in Egypt two years ago. Uh, so archaeology is, is like search and rescue. H here what we were doing is we were going into these caves off the coast of the Red Sea and we were also uh, going into the pyramids. So, so archaeology is like search and rescue except everyone's been dead for 5,000 years, so there's really no rush. So we can really take our time and, and go through things. So in all these applications, what we're doing is a form of minimally invasive surgery. So it makes sense, maybe we should shrink these robots down to real minimally invasive surgery. Now the reason for doing uh, less invasive surgery is it, it's less pain on the patient, it actually costs less, and it also provides an opportunity for medical care to be delivered outside of centers of medical excellence, outside of hospitals, offices, and perhaps in rural and third world countries. The problem with minimally invasive surgery is that you only have two types of devices. Actually, I'm curious, has, has anyone had a knee operation yet? Any uh, arthroscopic surgery? Yeah, that's nice. Um, so, so minimally invasive surgery, there's two types. There's your rigid laparoscopes that can allow access to points that are in line of sight of where the incision's made, or you have endoscopes. They're flexible, but they buckle easily. A surgical snake robot has the best of both worlds. You're both flexible and rigid at the same time. So what we did is, uh, working with my colleague, Mark Lozanati, we, 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 we uh, de developed this mechanism, and we're doing a lot of minimally invasive cardiac surgery. So here we're operating on a live pig, it's about a, a 35 to 40 kilogram pig, and we're doing a procedure called a left atrial appendectomy. So we're, in, so we're in, well that was me. So we're entering the subxiphoid process here, and then we're able to make a 25 millimeter turn one way, a 25 millimeter turn the other way, and we're behind the heart where we can deliver a whole host of therapies and diagnostics. So your pericardium is transparent, so you can see through the pericardium as to where the snake robot is. Now this is not minimally invasive surgery, just so you know. Um, it's more like this. So on the operation day, the robot is pushed or fed into the uh, anatomy, and then we drive through uh, between the pericardium and the heart using the onboard visualization system to localize where we are and to be able to deliver whatever therapy or diagnostic. So here again, we're in the live pig, but now we're seeing the vantage point from the robot. We're not looking from the outside. So this is the apex of the heart, and now you're going to see we're going to go in. So remember, the pericardium is transparent, so what you're going to be able to see is the lungs, because we're able to see uh, you know, going out. So this pig here, your lungs are white, so you can tell this is a, a non-smoking pig, and here's the heart uh, beating. The high point of this is, I, I should say, that the university uh, uh, through this technology over the fence, and now it's being commercialized by a company called Med Robotics, which is based in, uh, outside of Boston in Raynham. 
I'm a founder of the company, but, but I don't have that much ownership of it, so don't be extra nice to me. Uh, if you want to make a lot of money and uh, invest in one of these companies, don't start one. And, and here's the high point of the experience for me. We actually operate on our person. So what you're seeing here is the snake robot entered this uh, person's sub xiphoid process uh, right over here. And we made a 20 millimeter turn one way, a 20 millimeter turn the other way. And we're behind the heart performing what's called an epicardial mapping. What you're seeing in this video is the live uh, fluoroscopy, so it's like a live x-ray, as the snake goes around her heart. And then this video here is the direct visualization. So these are her lungs, and below it are the beating heart. So with that, I will stop. Brilliant. And obviously, uh, you guys are over there on the show floor. And if uh, there are any other willing participants to get a snake travel up their leg, are they free to do that? Yeah, so That's we'll be brilliant. here they'll, they'll be here all day. <laughs> Great. Uh, well, thanks very much. Uh, just a round of applause quickly, please, for the guys from. <laughs> thanks very much, guys. All right. Thank you for your attention.